Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis of FanDuel, who's here to help us break down Week 12 from a DFS perspective. What's happening, Jim? I'm excited, Greg. It is a bad quarterback week. A lot of guys to have struggled so far this year are in plus matchups, which should be pretty fun. So I'm excited to talk about them and talk about this slate. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastically. I'm ready to rock, ready to look forward for Week 12, ready to get back to it. So let's begin with your favorite stack of the week, and it involves the Atlanta Falcons, who have been playing really well as of late. So this week, you're matching up Matt Ryan and Julio Jones. It's against the Bucks. What more is there to say? Yeah, there's really not a whole lot. We know that the Bucks try to encourage teams to pass against them because they're very good against the rush and not that good against the pass. And obviously, the Falcons are a desirable spot. Now, people will look at Julio Jones's record against the Fal or against the Buccaneers and say we should use him because of that. But honestly, that doesn't matter because it's a different team, different offense around him, and the Bucks are a different team. The reason we should want to use Julio Jones is because he's good and because he's been getting a lot of volume recently. If we look at the three games since Mohamed Sanu left, Julio Jones has 27% of the Falcons' overall targets to go with 56% of their deep targets in that time. He's been getting fed, and that was true last week, too, with Austin Hooper being out. They just announced earlier that Austin Hooper will miss once again this week, which should guarantee that Julio's going to get a lot of volume against the 24th-ranked pass defense, and they're much worse if you take sacks out of the equation. So Julio definitely in play. He is $8,400. Matt Ryan, $7,900. He is at home. He is facing a bad pass defense. And Matt Ryan has been good this entire year. Now, it does matter for Matt Ryan that his pass catchers have been depleted, but he's still got... You still got Julio Jones, still got Calvin Ridley. So I think that it's still okay to go with Matt Ryan here in what should be a pretty fun game. So Ryan at 79 makes sense, as does Julio. I would say Calvin Ridley is still a bit underpriced, honestly, at $6,700. So I would never talk you out of him, but Julio is primed for a blow up here pretty soon. He's getting tons of deep volume. And against the Bucs, he is more likely to convert on that. So I am not going to go at Julio because he's done well against the Bucs. I'm going there because he's been getting a lot of volume and he is more likely likely convert on that volume so i think julio jones week may finally be here in week number 12 you know it's coming it's only a matter of time before the julio blow of a week and against the bucks the history may be not be great but that's fine this secondary is brutal matt ryan paired with julio jones at these prices it makes all the sense in the world they're who are being locked into my lineup and they should be locked into yours as well but if you don't like matt ryan and julio jones that combination on the other side, with Jameis Winston and Mike Evans, they make sense. But I got to throw this out there to you, Jim. The Atlanta secondary has played a lot better as of late, especially coming out of the bye. They certainly have. And I think that's something to keep in mind here. And I think that that's a good enough reason to not use Jameis Winston and Mike Evans in cash games because Evans is very expensive and we want to prioritize expensive running backs. And Winston has a bad floor because he will occasionally fumble and throw picks. And by occasionally, I mean pretty often. Those are reasons why we can lower the bucks for cash games. But for tournaments, we can still go here because when we go to Jameis Winston and Mike Evans, we're not going there for efficiency. We are going there for volume, and that volume should be there when they are on the road and facing the Atlanta Falcons. Additionally, we can look at those two games for the Falcons and be totally off of, you know, using teams against them, but that Saints game was a pretty big rivalry. Maybe we can, you know, justify it that way, and Kyle Allen played terribly against the Saints as well, or against the, the Falcons as well, independent of the defense playing well. And we look at defenses. Defense is harder to predict. It's less sticky than offense. It's a two-game sample here for the Falcons. So while I believe they are probably a significant amount better than what they were before their bye, I'm not ready to say they are a defense we need to avoid in tournaments just yet. The personnel is still lacking with Keanu Neal being out. So I think that's definitely a plus for the Bucks here. And I think that if it lowers the interest in people in using guys like Winston and Evans, that's even more beneficial for us because Winston is just $7,600. It's a really good number for a guy who should be throwing the ball quite a bit this weekend. And Evans is down to $8,000. He's had some struggles recently the past two games, but the yardage, yardage has still been there. 69 yards last week. He was over 80 yards week before that. He has 41% of the deep targets this year and 35% of the red zone targets. So the blow up ability is still there for Mike Evans, even we do assume that this Falcons defense is better than what they were before. And because of that, I still want to go at this stack. Again, we should lower expectations for the Bucks, given what the Falcons have done the past two weeks, 
But that does not mean we should avoid them entirely. So I think that this Bucks team still makes a lot of sense. And I really do hope that the interest in them is lowered because of what the Falcons have done the past two weeks. I think it's possible. I think you're going to get a, a bit of a mismatch here with the ownership levels with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers because people will be scared off by what the Falcons secondary has done. And Jameis Winston and all those interceptions as well. But Mike Evans has played well over his last several games. And I think if him and Jameis can get on the same page and we can dominate the Falcons secondary like we did earlier in the year, this is a nice spot where they'll probably be under-owned and maybe worth putting in a few lineups. Moving on from this game, let's get to Cleveland, where we've been waiting for the Odell Beckham blow-up game for a while. Pair him with Baker Mayfield this week against the Dolphins, and it's a nice combination. If Odell goes another inch, he has a touchdown, and it's a much different outlook going into this week uh, than we currently have. A lot of people are back on the Baker Mayfield hype train this week. What say you? Count me in as well, because this Browns offense has faced a really, really tough schedule so far this year. If you look at adjusted pass defense numbers over on number fire, this will be the second time all year in now 11 games where the Browns have faced a team outside the top 20 in pass defense and the Dolphins are dead last. So they have had nine games against top 20 pass defense is just one against worst pass defense. And so one game against a team ranked outside the top 20, and that is while facing the first, second, third, sixth, and 12th ranked pass defense this year. And four of those five games came on the road. This time they are at home. They're facing the 32nd ranked pass defense. And there is no question. This is the best spot the Browns have been, been in this entire year. Once you adjust for the schedule the Browns have faced, they're actually the 16th ranked passing offense in the league based on number of fires metrics. So they actually have not been nearly as bad as perception. They have not been good. You know, 16th is not great, but they haven't been as bad as perception. That puts me on Baker Mayfield at $7,500. I think that it makes sense for Odell Beckham, too. If we look at the two games that Kareem Hunt has played, he's gotten a lot of volume. We've still seen Beckham get 33% of the Browns' targets in those two games. He is getting almost all the deep work, and we're getting him here at $7,000. The volume has been there for Beckham all year long, but the efficiency hasn't been. Part of that's been because he and Baker have not been necessarily on the same page, but it's also been due to tough matchups. He will not have a tough matchup this weekend, so I think if I had one tournament lineup, I'd have a hard time not plugging in Beckham. I think it would make a lot of sense to pair him with Baker Mayfield as well. On the train here with the Cleveland Browns going up against the Dolphins, Baker Mayfield pairing up with Odell Beckham Jr. as solid as they come, theoretically, this week against Miami. Moving on, we go to the New Orleans Saints, where you're pairing Alvin Kamara with the Saints defense. Panthers offense has taken step backs in recent weeks. Kyle Allen throwing all of those interceptions last week. Can the Saints secondary make him do it again? Yeah, I think what we saw last week from the Saints is pretty encouraging because there was no Marshawn Lattimore in that game, and they still played well. Marshawn Lattimore may not be back here, but I think that even with that being the case, it's Kyle Allen going on the road. And when you adjust to the schedule the Panthers have faced so far this year, they are the 31st-ranked passing offense in terms of efficiency, which sets the Saints' defense up really well. We also saw last week what the Saints will do with their running backs when they're in a positive script. We haven't really seen that since Alvin Kamara came back from his injury, and we saw it last week. And yeah, his snap rate did go down to 61%, but the usage was still there. Kamara had 13 carries and 10 targets. 13 carries is not a lot, but 10 targets for a running back is equivalent to 20 carries if you adjust for the value in a target relative to a carry. And that's a lot of work for a guy who is hyper-efficient, running behind a good offensive line, and tied to a very good quarterback. So if you guarantee me a similar workload for Alvin Kamara this week, I think he makes a lot of sense at $8,300. Now, the raw touch total, I think, is enough where you don't need to target Kamara in cash games. You can target him there, but I don't think you have to. But as far as tournaments go, this guy always has multi-touchdown upside, and he can turn any of those targets into a long game. So Alvin Kamara, I think last week made me feel a lot better about him from a usage perspective, even if the Saints do get ahead here, which is why I'm willing to pair him with the Saints defense. Both options are very costly, so it's not easy to get there. But I think given the struggles the Panthers offense has had, and given the usage Kamara had last week, it's a stack that has good odds of paying off. As long as that usage is there for Alvin Kamara, you're in a good spot. The New Orleans Saints defense, as you mentioned, look back. And if last week is any indication, there's someone that you can rely on going forward. Certainly this week against Carolina and the interception machine, Kyle Allen. You got to like the New Orleans Saints, especially Alvin Kamara. 
Up next, we get to the New York Jets. I was waiting for this one. Sam Darnold, Jamison Crowder facing off against the Raiders secondary that certainly has been leaky. Crowder has been really good whenever Sam Darnold's in the lineup. And Darnold, as soon as the schedule is eased up, has obviously looked better of late as well. Darnold and Crowder, this is an easy one if you want to go down and not spend the money up for the Atlanta guys. Yeah, I agree because the Jets are in a good spot from a fantasy perspective because what they are this weekend is they are a home favorite who is a slight underdog against a bad pass defense. What that means, they'll probably get a good amount of volume from a passing perspective, and they should be efficient in that volume, which is exactly what we want for Sam Darnold at $7,400 facing the 27th ranked pass defense. The, The Raiders did perform well last weekend, but they're facing Ryan Finley at home. Now they're on the road and facing the Jets. And yeah, Sam Darnold has been volatile and he has failed to come through even in a good matchup against the Dolphins but he has also shown good upside good volatility and the ability to have a ceiling game which I think is what we want out of a quarterback regardless of salary we do have that with Darnold here at $7,400 I like him a lot as far as stacking him you could go back to Robbie Anderson but the volume just has not been there I think that he's still intriguing but I mean, Jamison Crowder is $6,500, and he has had an awesome role whenever Darnold has played, exactly as you said. Crowder, uh, in the games that Darnold has played, has 26% of the team's targets, partially inflated by that Buffalo game where he had 17 targets. But even since Darnold came back, we've seen Crowder getting a lot of targets, and some of those have been downfield as well, which has allowed Crowder to have some yardage. He has had 75 or more yards in three straight games. He has had at least uh, 75 yards five total times this year, five out of seven games Darnold has played so we don't think of Crowder as being a big yardage guy but the yardage has been there which gives him upside especially for $6,500 so this is a script that sets up well for a lot of pass attempts to the Jets and it sets up for efficient pass attempts and Crowder has been the best piece in this passing offense so I think that when you're going with Darnold you can give some thought to Robbie Anderson but with the volume Crowder is getting it's really hard for me to turn him down at $6,500. Like you said, an easy spot for the New York Jets this week at home against the Raiders team that's vulnerable. Raiders are riding high right now. Jets, well, they're playing pretty well as well. They're in a good spot here. Take advantage with Jameson Crowder and Sam Darnold. One last stack to get to, and that brings us to the Seattle Seahawks. Coming off a bye, you're pairing Russell Wilson with DK Metcalf. Is this because we're still questionable about Tyler Lockett, or is it just the fact that they're facing an Eagles secondary that has proven to be vulnerable all season long? It's a bit of a combination of both, but I think that DK Metcalf is a good option, even if Tyler Lockett does play, because we've seen now three games since Will Dis or, sen- or a couple of games since Will Disley got hurt. I believe it's four games since Disley got hurt, and Metcalf's volume has been good in that sample, even while playing alongside Tyler Lockett. In those games without Will Disley, Metcalf's target share is 25%. He's averaging just a hair under two deep targets per game. He's getting work in the red zone, too. So even while playing alongside Tyler Lockett, Metcalf has been really good and been getting a lot of volume. If we, you know, take Lockett out of the equation or simply just lower him a bit, that would bode well for additional volume for DK Metcalf. He is $6,700, and I think that when you're getting that many high leverage targets for that salary, it's really hard to pass up. I think this Eagles defense, as they've gotten healthier, has gotten a lot better, but they're also facing Russell Wilson. And Russell Wilson is efficient against pretty much any defense. I think that Wilson makes a lot of sense here as well. I shouldn't have to talk you into him, but I think that Wilson is always a fun guy when his odds of having to pass are a little bit higher. This time he is on the road. He is facing Philadelphia as a two-point underdog. The line has shifted in favor of Seattle, so uh, maybe won't be a two-point dog on Sunday, but... It's still a script where we should not expect the Seahawks to get a lead and then just grind grind clock with Chris Carson. That is great for Russell Wilson. I hope that Alshon Jeffrey is able to play here because that would be better from a shootout perspective. Hopefully we can get the Eagles to score some points too and keep the Seahawks passing. But I think overall, it's still a good spot to go at the Seahawks passing offense. Lockett makes sense if he can go. He is $7,400, but I'm also okay taking those savings, jumping down to DK Metcalf at 67 and locking him in with Russell Wilson. The savings you get from Lockett to Metcalf, especially with Metcalf being healthier than Lockett at this point in the season, makes a lot of sense. And as you said, when you get a passing spot for Russell Wilson, we got to take advantage. That's what we have this week, hopefully against Philly. And as you mentioned, we want to get that back-and-forth game that keeps Russell Wilson passing. Otherwise, Brian Schottenheimer will bring this offense into a shell, and we'll go back to the old Chris Carson, Seattle Seahawks defense stack. That's going to do it for us here on The Hurry Up Gym. It's been a blast. It's been so much fun. We should do it again tomorrow.
Yeah, why not? We'll talk some values tomorrow. Should be a good slate for that, too. And uh, I think it should be a fun slate overall. So I'm looking forward to it, Greg. And we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Undervalued plays is the story for tomorrow. We hope to have you here. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.